Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our podcast series, Data Movers. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, CEO and founder of JSA, along with my fabulous co-host, top B2B social media influencer. Everyone knows him and loves him, Mr. Evan Christel. Hey, Evan. Hey, Jamie. Good to see you. Well, not everyone loves me, but a few people do. But uh, <laughs> welcome to uh, Data Movers, where we sit down with the most influential men and women of today's leading telco and data center world, supporting the network infrastructure requirements of this new normal. But first, before we, we dive into the interview, let's talk about some tech news, specifically the color of my uh, hoodie here, which is green. Mm. Um, there's, there's just tons of, of hype and progress in sustainability and green technology in the cloud and data center space. Um, do you think it's more buzzword or, or greenwashing or actual progress? Uh, sometimes I wonder how much is buzz and how much is real progress with sustainable innovation in, in technology. What do you think? Great question. Great question. And I'm going to go with progress because gosh darn it, we're, we're writing a book about it. And, and, and if this is in progress and I don't know what is, but I, Wait, I, wait, wait. Stop the presses here. You're writing a book. We, oui, we. Oui. It's a multi-author book called Greener Data, and it's going to be released uh, on Amazon on Earth Day, so April 22nd. Just a few short wow, weeks from now. That is, that is phenomenal. So yes, and uh, got, I kind of understand the premise, but what's 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 the perspective on the book? What are you going to dive into? I've, I've asked um, all, all of our um, amazing uh, clients and community members. I did sort of a call for authors here and got such a phenomenal response, just industry thought leaders weighing in on how to uh, not just come to, to carbon neutrality, but reduce carbon emissions um, in our data centers, in our network infrastructure. Um, and, um, and, and also, you know, how do we bring back biodiversity? So it's, it's a really wonderful um, a book. I've been in a very fortunate position where I hear from my friends in Finland. I hear from my friends in Hong Kong. I hear from my friends um, in, in uh, the middle of the States. And I'm, and I'm hearing all these wonderful, uh, creative ways to approach getting more greener in our space. Um, and I was like, guys, we can't just share this as competitive you know, uh, insight. We need to really, you know, shout it out and, and do it immediately. So when I asked folks in December, like, let's, let's do a book in April, people were like, can you do that? I'm like, we're going to find out. So <laughs> we're finding out. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, I can't wait to read the book. We're going to have to do a special bonus episode on the book. Um, but until then, wh wh why don't we get on to our guest? She's a fascinating and key player in the data center space. He is. And, and what a wonderful transition too, because, uh, um, we have, of course, Craig McKesson. He's the chief customer and marketing officer at T5 Data Centers. And T5 has been writing about uh, sustainability for, for years now in our space. So, Craig, it's an honor to bring you on to Data Movers. And thank you, thank you for all you do in our industry. Thanks so much, Jamie. Nevin, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, just excited to be a part of your podcast today. Thanks, Craig. And, and let's start with a brief introduction. Maybe you can introduce yourself and T5 data centers for those who aren't familiar. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, so again, my name is Craig McKesson. I'm Chief Customer and Marketing Officer at T5 Data Centers. If uh, you don't know T5, we're really the industry's only uh, full lifecycle data center services partner. And, and what does that mean? It means we're really there from the beginning of the actual development of the data center uh, and working with the customer through the actual interior construction and infrastructure construction. And then uh, more, even more importantly, there for the ongoing facility management, sustainability, and, and renewable portion of, of the assignment. And so um, what we've done is really carved a niche around uh, being that partner that's there with our customers, both enterprise and hyperscale, uh, from the beginning all the way through uh, their project. You know, and, and what you do at T5 is, is so, so special. So many, so many beautiful niches that I want to 
touch on uh, shortly, but I got to start with, sorry to embarrass you out of the gate, but this is so cool. I couldn't help it. But we found out that you had some experience as a captain in the U.S. Air Force, which sounds fascinating because you were stationed at the Los Angeles Air Force Base, the home of Space and Missile Systems Center. That's correct. That's correct. Yes. Um, so uh, I had the privilege of, of serving in the Air Force and um, really I got, I got lucky. I got, I got stationed in uh, Los Angeles. Um Worked um, as uh, an officer uh, helping launch uh, GPS uh, satellites in, into space. So I worked on the Delta launch vehicle. Um, we always used to like to say, for those people who are old enough to remember, it was a little bit like working on the set of I Dream a Genie. And so you got a chance to, to you know, be in the, in, the, in the bunker with the headset on during a launch, um, crawling around the, 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 uh, the launch pad in Cape Canaveral. Um, it was a really unique experience. And, and little did I know at the time, um, the project that we were working on, as I said, was the, the GPS system, uh, was really going to transform the way we all do business and live on a day-to-day basis. It certainly has. That is fantastic. I'd personally like to thank you for GPS. I remember the days of driving around with MapQuest and Maps uh, in my car, and it was it was a hell on earth. So thank you. That for was that. the thing. That was the thing. And so you know, being in LA, they had this thing called the Thomas Guide, which was literally you know two or three inches thick. Uh, and in, in order to get around, you would go from page B3 to page, you know, C7, and you're flipping back and forth. Uh, and that's how you did it. And, you know, now today, it's either you pick up your phone or you look at your watch. And, um, you know, I, I mean, most of the time, I don't think I could get from A to B without just watching the dot on uh, the car. Yeah, kids these on. days have no idea of the struggle. But so how did that experience then translate into your career path subsequent, uh, and then getting into commercial real estate and then data center. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, my first job in commercial real estate after transitioning out of the air force, um, I was actually interviewing with, um, LaSalle partners and I was talking to a manager, managing director there at the time. And he looks at me and he said, well, you know, Craig, you know, real estate isn't rocket science, uh, to which I deadpan. I said, well, that's okay because I used to work as one. <laughs> and and um, mic drop. Yeah, it was basically a mic drop. Tired. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, weeks or months later, you know, after I get the job and I'm starting, and we happen to be out, and we were grabbing a beer after work one day, and, and he says to me, "He's like, you know, he's like, I knew I was going to hire you as soon as you came back with that whole worked as a rocket scientist thing." <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it was actually basically it got me the job and it got me a start in the business. Oh, I love that story. And, you know, we, we sort of teased it up, but I want to get back to it. T5, they do things a little different. And I love that. Um, so let's just get our, our readers, our viewers, uh, a little insight there. So, okay, let's start with 2 million work hour safety record. Tell us more. Yeah, Jimmy, I mean, we're super proud of it. So um, I'll talk a little bit about our life cycle services and, and a big portion of that is our facility management business. And so we not only operate our own T5 data centers, but we operate data centers on behalf of some of the world's largest and best companies around the world. We actually operate about 55 data centers and 20 markets around, around the world today uh, and, and have grown that team to about 500 um, critical facilities technicians. Wow. And so um, we're super proud really to, and take our tagline, which is forever on, and expand that out to being forever safe, forever on. As we know, I mean, data centers can be incredibly dangerous environments. You're working, you know, around, you know, basically lightning in a box, megawatts of power. Uh, and um, just as we pass over the new year, um, we reached 2 million consecutive work hours without a last, lost time accident across any of our sites. And so um, that is just an incredible milestone. We're super proud of that. Um, it's really important to all of our customers as well. Um, and um, it's something that we really hang our hat on in terms of our culture, our processes, our training. Um, and uh, we just want the world to know about it. Yeah, that's phenomenal. I, I recall that fire at that data center and company, uh, I won't mention them, but in, in Paris a few months ago, and it, it was a, just a terrifying kind of incident. It took days, I think, to get under control. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so what makes up a, a top-notch facility management capability? I mean, what are the best practices or what's the special sauce 
uh, behind <laughs> what you do. What's what's your secret? Basically, give it all away now, right here. Yeah, give it all away. <laughs> so you know, like any good recipe, like any good recipe, it all starts with having the great right foundation. Um, you know, um, you know, I love to cook, and one of the things I learned early on when um, I started, you know, training. Uh, for cooking was you need mise en place, which means have all of your ingredients out and ready to go and be ready. Uh, when the fire is hot, you have it all ready, you can, you can get it done right. And mm -hmm. so we really approach facility management in the same, same way in terms of you know, a foundation of you know, training and process and procedure and building a culture around following directions. You know, we um, recruit and retrain the best. You know, we, we recruit a, a lot of, um, you know, transitioning veterans, a lot of former um, uh, people who worked as Navy nuclear technicians, you know, people who understand what mission critical really means. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, our customers are trusting us with their business. Um, they're basically handing the keys of their business over to us as a data center provider and facility manager. And so um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the fire that happened over um, in, in France, um, you know, that, that can knock people out, not only, you know, put lives in danger, but can and knock businesses out for an incredible amount of time. And so we take that really, really seriously, but it all comes back down to understanding the fundamentals um, being trained, being drilled so that when something does go wrong, we know how, exactly how to um, go about and, and mitigate that situation uh, with minimal loss. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's, it's funny, and, and I'm thinking about so many uh, military men and women who um, have brought have been brought into our data center ecosystem world, and you know, looking at our processes with that um, engineering focus, being prepared ahead before the 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 fires on the grill. Um, I, and I and I think there's a lot to that. It kind of brings me also. I heard a little bit about your project, your newest project, serving the U.S. Army Cyber Command in Augusta. Can you tell us any more about that? Yeah, Jamie, yeah, we're super excited about this. So we just announced it a couple of weeks ago, um, but we're in the early phases of launching a 190-acre, 200-megawatt um, data center campus. Uh, as you said, located in Augusta, Georgia, but um, even more uniquely, um, directly adjacent to Fort Gordon, which is also home of the U.S. Army Cyber Security Command Headquarters. And so um, we believe, you know, it's a you know, real estate is all about location, location, location. And, um, you know, this site has great access to low cost, reliable power, We've got tremendous you know, fiber connectivity. Uh, and then the adjacency to everything that's going on on the Cyber Command side really sets it up well um, to serve the needs of you know, Fed cloud, government cloud, any of the hyperscalers who are serving that market um, to really customize and build um, whatever type of uh, data center they need. Amazing. Wow, sounds like a great project. Uh, but talk as well about expansion in general. We're seeing a tremendous surge in uh, requirements and capacity an explosion in uh, in demand. What sort of expansions do you have on the horizon in your your locations? Yeah, that's right, Evan. I mean, there really seems to be an insatiable insatiable demand right now for data center capacity, really all over the world. And and um, you know, we're seeing the same thing at T five. Um, we've recently opened a new facility um, in Chicago in Elk Grove Village sub market. Um, so we have um, available commission capacity there. Um, same thing in Hillsboro, Oregon, just outside of Portland. Um, we also have a new facility going up in um, Silicon Valley as well. So those kind of are, you know, really our three flagship facilities. We have an, another large campus opportunity in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, um, and then uh, also have a, an existing campus with uh, capacity in, in Charlotte as well. And so we have a, a pretty nice geographic footprint uh, footprint there. And uh, we're really set up um, to customize needs. You know, we've, we've really founded our business um, by partnering with uh, kind of the more uh, high touch uh, enterprise customers, those customers that really understood the, the meaning of quality and, and how we uh, can customize their solutions to their needs. 
Um, we've taken that and expanded it out to larger size um, requirements. Um, we're working with hyperscale customers now and the cloud customers as well. Uh, and so I think really the, the sky's the limit as we continue to expand our portfolio. Oh my goodness. Uh, location, location, location. Just like you said, those are some key spots. I'll tell you, um, I, um, I, I can see why expansion is on the horizon for you. Also, I cannot, uh, you, you, you mentioned it. I have to go back. I, I'd be, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't, but um, you went through not only military boot camp, but also culinary boot camp. Uh, tell wow, us about, the Renaissance man. <laughs> yeah, well, he mentioned cooking, so I figure it's fair game now. Um, but tell us about the Culinary Institute of America, you know, the other CIA. And, That's right. You know, what is it, what is it like when it comes to whipping you into top <laughs> Well, you know, so it's interesting. I did, you know, I did mention I like to cook. And so, you know, and I'm tying this back to the digital economy, my first foray into cooking actually started with an app. And so I think it was an early version of the Mario Batali app. And it was like how to cook, you know, pasta for granted. It was like really, really simple stuff. Uh, but it, it ignited kind of this fire inside of me that I just had this creative side and the technical side and it kind of put it all together. And so, you know, I, I took that app and I kind of, you know, started to try different recipes and I started trying different things and I really started to want to really understand the fundamentals. And then I saw that um, the Culinary Institute of America was giving, uh, was hosting boot camps. So it was really a seven day boot camp um, at the CIA um, in St. Helena up, on, up in Napa. Uh, and it was an absolutely incredible opportunity. I mean, it was just an incredible experience, incredible opportunity. Um, you know, they dress you up in the chef's coat and the checkers and you're in there at 630 in the morning with the rest of the students, uh, the CIA, and you have your section and basically you're going through every fundamental type of, of cooking process and understanding how, uh, how to execute each one, how they're used, why they're used, um, and then creating a menu and sitting down with all the other students at the CIA and getting critiqued by the different chefs. Um, so that's kind of the boot camp part, um, and then enjoying a great meal. And then to top it off, you're there in the afternoon, you can go wine tasting and then rinse and repeat, you know. For so you, you didn't have a Gordon Ramsay type yelling at you the whole time. This was more laid back. Than, uh, yeah. So they, they kind of realized that they kind of realized that we're, um, you know, we're hobbyists. <laughs> 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 they, didn't, they didn't want to scare us away, but, okay. um, but it was a fantastic experience because again, it really, um, you know, taught us how um, to approach different things and, and what technique needs to be used for what type of process. And, um, and it's really, you know, increased my confidence level in the, in the kitchen. So well, I, I, was saying, I, was, I was afraid my husband would send me off to this culinary boot camp. But now <laughs> after hearing about it, I'm like, not such a bad It's not so bad. It's I'll not go so to bad. the wine tasting part too. Oh, come on, good. Jamie. You know, you have chefs and personal staff <laughs> to do all these things. <laughs> My husband wishes. I boil water. I'm like, I can do pasta and that's it, you know. Uh, but, oh, now let's, uh, getting back to you, Craig. <laughs> um, I love this part of um, Data Movers where we sort of do this rapid fire segment where, you know, we'll just throw out some crazy, wacky, quick questions and you just respond with the first thing that comes to mind. So, uh, okay, talking food, culinary. What would be the favorite food that would surprise folks? Good question. You know, I, I think I would have to go with um, probably paella. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's one, it's incredibly fun to make. Yeah, especially if you do it over an open fire. Um, I do it just over you know, a Kamado Joe or a big green egg. Um, but it's just this interesting mix of great flavors. Um, you know, I grew up in Northern Wisconsin, so I like casserole. So this is kind of a Spanish casserole. So you know, you've got, you've got rice and you've got seafood and you've got uh, chorizo. And it's just this amazing mix of, of flavors that comes together. And then even more importantly, it's, it's one of those meals that you share as a group. Uh, so it's just, it's one of those things where you can entertain with it and get people together um, raise a nice glass of wine and just, you know, really share good times with good friends. Now I got to go search paella on DoorDash. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. That sounds really good. Uh, favorite holiday to celebrate. I'm guessing one with food uh, involved. Uh, well, you know, 
it wouldn't be a celebration without food. The holiday um, without food, right. You know, so that's an interesting question too. And I think this one I'm actually going to take back to, to COVID. Um, and so we had um, relocated uh, to Atlanta just before COVID and, um, you know, formed a couple, basically formed a pod um, with two other couples, real good friends. And um, for the holidays this past year, we actually, and it sounds a little bit cliche, but we uh, celebrated Festivus and we did it <laughs> with an authentic Festivus poll. And we had the airing of grievances. We did the whole thing. So we did the whole Festivus experience just, you know, because it had been two years of a pandemic and everybody cooped up and we just said, you know what, let's just, let's just do this. <laughs> and so that ended up being a heck of a lot of fun. That's that is absolutely right. hilarious. Yeah, yes. that's right. Love it. Oh my goodness. I love that. All right. <laughs> you, you mentioned you started your love for cooking on an app. So I'm wondering, would this be the app that you use most on your phone or would it be something more business related? I don't know. What's your favorite you know, app? So if I, look at, if I look at my phone, it's probably the app that gets used the most and, and it could be more appropriate, but it's my podcast app. Ah, yeah. So there you go. Um, so yeah, I actually spent a lot of time listening to podcasts. Um, it just is, you know, you can have access to so many different types of information anytime you want it. The real time access is amazing. Uh, and the variety and quality is amazing as well. Um, well. I hope you listen to Data Movers. Yeah, I say. I mean, it all starts. It all starts with Data Movers. Yeah. <laughs> nice plug. Rewind this section. Press play over and over again. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So this next question I have here may be redundant, but you know, with the Super Bowl. But what's your favorite sport? to watch i'm guessing football but uh, i'll let you uh tell our audience so well so i am a green bay packers shareholder and oh, have been for wow. years and years and years um but i have to say you know every four years it has to be curling because you know how can you not watch if i if i could guess every sport on on the planet that would want be the last i would say one. every oh, four no. years Every four years, you have this opportunity. How can you not watch a sport where Ron Swanson can compete for a gold medal? <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Right? I mean, it's, just, it's, just, it's so much fun um, <laughs> that, you know, it just, it is. It's going to, you know, that's the, I guess I'm in the, the Winter Olympics mode right now. No, uh, but you get a lot of these sports that kind of come up that you're not really uh, accustomed to seeing or watching or don't necessarily understand all the rules. And then you start to understand that there are people all over the world that do this and they're focused on it and, and they're training their whole lives to get to this point. Yeah. Um, this really obscure sport. And, you know, it's like kind of fun to watch. I know they all right. the sincerity, the, the seriousness on their faces. They're like launching that. Hey, they're, 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 they're sliding that rock and they're, you know, trying to get it into the house. And, yeah. And, you know, you, know. you just, to root for them really exactly yeah, no, I, I hear you <laughs> and um and how about your favorite sport to play then so i'm gonna kind of keep the the winter olympics theme so i love to ski i used to ski race as a kid and oh, wow. um was actually just fortunately i was actually just um uh, invited to become an ambassador for the u.s ski and snowboard association it was the u.s oh, ski and snowboard team um, so I've been involved with them for a number of years. And, and you know, again, it all kind of goes back to, you know, supporting the Olympic dream and, and, and everything that goes with that. So, you know, I love to ski. And then, you know, like, you know, most guys my age, I've been frustrated by golf for, you know, 40 years. And so, you know, play a lot of golf as well. And, and I'm, you know, I'm determined this is my year, right? This is the year I'm actually going to get better. So we'll see. I have to Fantastic. say, you got to draw the line between athletes, military men and women, and our data center infrastructure folks. Like, I think there's something there. Like, there's a lot of, um, you know, former skiers and runners, et cetera, that, that are a part of our industry as well. Sorry. That's right. Just That's drawing right. that line. Just say. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, no curling in the data center. <laughs> <laughs> You're a technologist. Um, you know, what's one thing you wish was never invented? And then on the flip side, what's your favorite invention of all time? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, never invented, you know? I appreciate being called a technologist. I also really think that invention is the root of all progress. And so, 
you know, and while I'm sure there are, you know, definitely examples of things that, you know, we all wish probably would not have been invented, there are always things that then either counter those or move things forward. And so, you know, I'm a big fan of just, you know, enabling people to have that creativity and that desire to go out and create the next thing. I mean, think about just, you know, over this conversation, we talked about, you know, what's happened just in our work careers. You know, I think back to, you know, the beginning of my work career and helping launch GPS satellites into orbit um, to where we are today using that technology and what comes next. Uh, I couldn't have fathomed that really, you know, back in the 90s when that was going on. Uh, and so what's going to happen here over these next generations as people continue to um, push the envelope and continue to invent things, right? I think that's really, at the end of the day, I think that's what um, really motivates the data economy, you know, what we all do, the industry we're in. And um, it's that it's that creative vigor, I think, that ultimately is, is you know, you know, make, bring the world together. It's definitely flattening it out. It's giving people opportunities that they never thought they would have uh, because of this technology. And I think ultimately it's just going to uh, continue to push us forward. So um, I don't have a specific, I know that's a long answer to your question, but um, uh, that's kind of how, you know, I don't think, I don't think I would say there's yeah. any. Fantastic. Well said. Well said. Yes. Well, thanks for joining us, Craig. It's been really fun. And uh, from the CIA to the air force to, curling to that was quite a tour de force of it. We covered some ground. So we covered some ground. We covered a lot of ground and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you. And listeners, viewers, if you enjoyed today's Data Movers podcast as much as we did, be sure to check us out, jsa.net slash podcast for upcoming Data Movers episodes releasing every other week, Wednesday mornings. Yeah, be, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Evan Kerstell and Jay Scotto and look forward to connecting there as well. And as always, guys, stay safe and happy networking.